this will be the official class recording. And uh, one thing that a student posted right before class that I saw, which I wanted to make sure and tell people, is there is a OWASP 20th anniversary conference free on Friday, September 24th. So you ought to uh, register if you want to go to this. It looks pretty good. They got a bunch of talks on web vulnerabilities and stuff. So that's a good thing to do. So check it out. And if you do go to it, it's worth extra credit. Let me know when it's over that you went to it. And um, all right. So here we are. This is 126. And um, this class is Tuesday. And there is a group that has regular Tuesday talks, technical talks, sometimes security, sometimes other topics. And I canceled class every month to make room for that. And next week is the first one of them. Um, Dan Turchin, AI and the Future of Work. So you'll see there are several of these things marked TBA for to be announced. And uh, those are going to be these talks by various people at this group called Bay ICT, which is a great group, a great group of people. Um, and uh, they do a lot of good things. And one of the good things they do is put on these talks. And I'll probably have other announcements about other things they do to help City College students. They've done some good things in the past. So anyway, next week, I will not have a lecture in this class. Instead, I recommend going here and listening to this. But after it's over, I'll open up Zoom as usual to answer student questions about projects and stuff. All right. Anyway, so today's topic is Ali Debug. Last week was um, debugging in general. And now we're going to talk about the specific debugger, the main debugger we're going to use in this class, Ollie Debug. It is not the newest. It's not arguably the best. What it is is the easiest to use, which is my number one consideration. For beginners, you just need to have the easiest one to use. And once you understand Ollie, then using another one like X64 Debug or something is really pretty easy. All right. Although the other one that's really important to know, Win Debug, is not easy. <laughs> But we're going to do that anyway, because WinDebug debugs the kernel, which Ollie cannot do. In fact, Ollie can only do 32-bit programs. X64 Debug can do 64-bit programs, though, and it's free, and it works almost exactly the same as Ollie. So that's good. But um, it still doesn't do the kernel. For that, you've got to use WinDebug. All right, so Ollie Debug was developed a decade ago. Ollie Debug 1.1, the source code was purchased by Immunity and rebranded as Immunity Debugger, and the two are essentially exactly identical. Uh, the Immunity Debugger is probably the more modern, better thing to use. Um, but Ollie has its advantages. They're all very, very much the same for all practical purposes. But Ollie is technically abandoned, and Immunity is the one that's currently still being developed. But they all have free versions that are fine, and they all work very much the same. So when you're going to debug malware, you're going to run the malware, and you're going to have it in a debugger so you can put in breakpoints and examine the code and watch the registers and variables change and all that. So you can launch an exe directly in Ollie Debug, or even a dill directly in Ollie Debug, or you can have the malware already running and attached to a running process. Those will all work. You can just do file open to open an exe. You can add command line arguments if there are any. And then it will load it into memory and stop. It will not run it. It will load it and stop so you can examine it. Because you know, if you wanted to just run it, you wouldn't be using a debugger. You presumably want to examine or modify it. So the debugger loads it and stops to let you look at it and do what you want. And it doesn't run it until you hit run. All right. So um, you can do file attach. Then it will attach to the running process, and it will break in and pause the process. And you'll end up at some random point in the flow of the process, of course, because you didn't get a chance to stop it at the start. All right. Um, so you can reload the current executable with Control F2 or Debug Reload. F2 sets a breakpoint. Um, and so here's the interface. At the top left, you have the disassembler. It shows you the assembly language instructions and the raw hexadecimal bytes and the address. Then you have the registers, like uh, EIP and ESP and EBP and all the good registers here. This is the stack, which includes all the temporary storage of variables. The most important thing on the stack is the return addresses that will be used to return from wherever you are to the routines above that called it. This is how you emerge. So you start with Windows, you launch some kind of Windows loading like WOW 6432, then you enter your program, then you enter a subroutine, then you enter a function call like print, and now you're like five or six layers down, and all those return addresses are on the stack, and you go to the stack to return from print 
to the subroutine, to the main routine, to back to the Windows operating system as you emerge out of the program to the higher levels. And here's just an area where you can dump memory. Any kind of memory you want, just dump it here in hexadecimal and ASCII. So, all right. Uh, you can modify data in the disassembler with the spacebar. That will let you recompile the data right there. Uh, you can also modify it in the registers or the stack or in the memory dump. In any of these regions, you can modify the data. Uh, that's the point of the debugger. You can change any part of the memory that the program is using in order to make it run differently. All right. Um, you can dump any part of it. You can dump any area of memory you want. You can right-click a memory address anywhere else and follow in and dump. So you can examine more of the memory at any location, and it really is very, very convenient. All right. The memory map is extremely useful. This lets you see how memory is being used by your program. So it identifies all the libraries, executables, and dills that are in here. These are libraries like Shell32 and Kernel, and, and here's the actual Lab09 sample running. It loads with the PE header here. That's the start of it. And then it has code, detect section, imports, and data is what this one has. It labels the section. It shows you where they start and how big they are. And it gives you the permissions, like read, write, execute for this stuff, which is... Uh, not good. You're not ever supposed to have write and execute permitted in the same memory segment. That is a uh, violation of the recommended security model for Windows, but the operating system here is breaking that rule. All right. When a module loads, it has a preferred base address where it would like to load, where it is naturally intended to load, but because of address space layout randomization or because that memory might already be in use, sometimes modules cannot load at their preferred address and they have to go somewhere else. And that's called rebasing. Therefore, technically, it takes longer to load the module because it has to modify some of the code. All the absolute memory references have to be rewritten. And um, if you have address space layout randomization turned on, which it is in all modern versions of Windows by default, then every EXE is constantly reloaded at a random location every time you launch it. And so this rebasing happens all the time. DILs are also relocated. Um, now, third-party DILs might all try to locate at the same address, like 400,000 where executables like to be, and then they'll constantly have to relocate. Microsoft is smarter than that. They make their official Microsoft DILs all have different base addresses, so that frequently they're able to load at their preferred address, and that is technically more efficient. Um, it's not a huge difference, but still, they, they avoid relocation just for efficiency. And so when you look at the code, like here, I'm going to move AX EBP plus variable 8. This is a calculated address. So if the whole thing is moved to a different area of memory, this command will probably continue to work. But this kind of thing, where you move um, to this specific location. Um, oh, this one here. See, this looks like it's going to a specific location. But that is an artifact of the assembly language. This says jump, if the last result was not zero, to this location, 40120. But I'm at 40120A. This is 40120 is only up here, like about 10 bytes behind. If you jump a small distance, like 10 bytes, if you look at the raw bytes of assembly language and look up what they do, it actually does it with what's called a short jump. It actually just does jump 10 bytes back. So in fact, it will relocate just fine. The fact that it puts the address here is just the... Uh, debugger or disassembler trying to make it easier for you to read it. But the actual instruction was not jump to this address, it was jump back 10 bytes. This one here, however, the loads EAX from this location far away, uh, that is really going to be an absolute address right there in the instruction. And therefore, if this program is relocated in memory, this instruction will not work anymore. And that's what the relocation section of the uh, program is used for, recording all the places where this happened so we can modify those addresses to make it run. All right. So that's the fix-up locations in the relocation section in the PE header. All right. Dills are loaded after the EXE as needed, and you can't predict where they're going to go if they get rebased. So uh, here's the relocation section. You see it in this. Uh, this is a device meta par data parsers dot dill, and as you see, it has a relocation section here, which uh, most modern programs do, so they can be rebased. You can remove 
the relocation section if you want to, and then that dill cannot be relocated. It must load at its referred base address, and I guess if you tried to load it and that address is unavailable, you'll get some kind of error message and it won't load. Um, I haven't tested it, but I think you'd get something like a missing dill error message. All right, that's the game, so uh, you avoid relocating dills if you care about maximizing performance. So here's dill rebasing. Dill A and Dill B both want to load at this address, which is 100 million in hex. And Dill A got to load there, but Dill B was unable to load there, so it had to be rebased up here to this other address, 350,000, and therefore it had to use this relocation section and rewrite some of the commands in the text section. Which is fine, but it just means it'll take a little longer to load that Dill. All right. So IDA. Um, we haven't started using IDA yet. We'll start that in two weeks. <coughs> but IDA is a disassembler and not a debugger. And since it's not attached to a real running process, it does not actually load your program in memory, getting it ready to run. Instead, it calculates what memory the program should load at and shows you that. So its, it's addresses are like theoretical instead of real. So if you use Ollie debug on a code and IDA Pro at the same time, they will not load it to the same address. IDA Pro will put it where it wants to be. Ollie will put it in a location which might be completely random or different, so it can be annoying. And there is an option in IDA Pro to avoid this. I've just gotten sort of used to that. You, The addresses are off by some number of thousands if you compare the two programs. All right, you can view threads. In principle, threads are little pieces of a running program that can run independently. Um, very rarely do you ever have to get down to the level of threads, though. But in principle, uh, the actual unit of a program that gets processor attention is a thread in Windows, not a process. Uh, but normally, you don't have to worry too much about it. But, but Ollie can look down to the level of threads. And each thread has its own stack. So you can... Uh, it can get complicated. And developing Windows heap exploits from scratch is really quite complicated because of this sort of thing. Um, some people are saying address space layout randomization is running out of its value. And they're beginning to talk this year about how uh, it's really not good enough. They're going to have to do something more in the future. Address space layout randomization was extremely effective at solving the buffer overflow exploits, which were the real problem up through Windows XP. The most common Windows exploits all relied on knowing where programs are loading. So when they randomized that, that killed off a whole generation of malware. And uh, the, develop the malware developers had to learn some new techniques to get past it. But it's looking, you know, that's, that's getting to be more than 10 years ago. It's looking like it's time to have some more new defenses added. All right. So to run your code, you can just use the debug menu, debug run, and so on. Debug step into, debug step over. But the shortcut keys are a lot nicer. F9 runs. Um, F7, F8, and F9 are the main ones I use. F7 takes a single step. F8 is step over. So it will move forward one instruction. But if the current instruction is a call, it will call the subroutine and go finish it until it's time to return and come back. It won't dump into them and stay down there. So this will step into a subroutine. This will step over a subroutine. These are what you usually do. F7 and F8 to move ahead. And F9 to just run. F9 will run the program until it stops for some other reason, like it hits a breakpoint or it opens a window asking you a question or something. It'll just run like it would outside the debugger until it has some natural reason to pause. All right, and there's some other ones here like run to selection, uh, execute until return, and this one sounds pretty good, execute until user code. I should remember this one more. I have done this thing where I step into the... Uh, subroutine until I'm somewhere in the kernel and I don't want to be there or in, in Microsoft libraries and Alt F9 would be a way to get out. Using VMware Fusion on a Mac, um, these are the right shortcuts. Um, you have function keys on your Mac keyboard. You might have to hold down a function key on the left, a little FN key to get them, that's all. Absolutely, I'm also using VMware Fusion on a Mac. And you should still have the function keys at the top, F1, F2. Um, well, I guess I've got them on this keyboard, which I guess is a Windows keyboard. Uh, my Mac has that touch bar. Actually, it's a good question. If I was actually using my Mac 
keyboard built in and the touch bar I think there are still a way to get function keys up there I think there, yeah there's a function yeah there's a function key at the bottom lower left of the screen if you hit that the touch bar turns into f1 f2 f3 so they should be there good and by the way you can always just use the menu debug run it if you have to but these function keys are really handy they're very good questions you're asking all right and sometimes when you have that kind of trouble um the thing is google and check there are in fact some uh some uh settings inside vmware fusion to have how the keys map and such yeah check it out I, i've had to learn some special key presses and made some adjustments to my mac to make it easier for virtual machines because that's all i do i use virtual windows on a mac which is highly recommended by the way because then your windows malware can't really affect the mac so it's a pretty good way to stay sanitary is do your malware analysis in vmware on a mac run until user code means um if if you see if you um it means go to code that was compiled by the developer of this code not windows libraries that's what it means you go until code that was run that is not a part of windows which is normally what you want and we talked about this before and i'll point it out when we get to the demo pretty soon um you when you're running a program there's the part that you wrote in some language like visual basic or c plus plus and then you compile it and that's usually where you want to analyze because that's where most people are making mistakes but the way all windows programs work is they call windows api function calls which call the software microsoft wrote to do stuff and unless you're trying to debug the microsoft operating system you're probably trying to debug the program above it because this is a malware analysis class you're trying to debug the malware you're not really trying to find windows vulnerabilities you're trying to understand the malware so you do not really want to be wandering through the code microsoft wrote that's all you skip the windows stuff yeah you you run the windows stuff and finish doing what it does and get back to the developer's code that's exactly what it is yeah i heard in your podcast a while back about vmware on the new mac chips yes absolutely Yes, if you have the new Mac, the M1, you cannot run virtual machines. Not at all right now. Um, there is a new pr product in sort of beta that just came out like last week that say they do implement virtualization, but the problem is it's an ARM-based chip. So what you get is an ARM-based virtual environment, so you can't run Windows because there is no Windows available for ARM. The only Windows version available for ARM is like a limited prototype version that you're not supposed to be able to get you can only get sort of illegally through BitTorrent or something um, so it's a drag you cannot really run virtual machines on the m1 at all for all practical purposes not right now um, i expect that will change sometime within the next six months or a year but right now if you have an m1 the very newest mac you can't run vms on it at all so that's the thing to know good these are very good questions all right so you can run a program and you could like click pause to f pause it while it's running but most programs are of course running really fast so you're not going to hit it very accurately yes if you still have an older mac or a pc that's good you know what i do is i have a private cloud i'm running a server which has virtual machines on a windows machine run an x86 platform or x64 platform which i can remote control that's another way to do it you could also use like an azure virtual machine or a google cloud virtual machine from your m1 and that would be fine too that's the uh yeah that's a that's the modern way to do things i have some students in this class that are using azure windows 10 machines and one thing about that is it's extremely sanitary right i mean if that malware does anything bad it's not even anywhere near you <laughs> it's on a virtual cloud somewhere else that's that's like the maximum safety it also means of course that you don't have to have the right hardware at all all you need to have is a browser running on anything a chromebook an iPad or anything all the actual code is running on a cloud machine at Microsoft which is perfectly fine all right so breakpoints is a much more precise way to stop at the right place trying to run a program while it's running and hit break is available in the debugger but it's not normally useful I would suppose it would only be useful for something like a game where you can see something moving across the screen and tell when to break you can run which will just resume execution normally you can run two selections so you can click on an instruction and it'll stop right before that instruction of course if it never gets to that instruction then it will just run forever <coughs> and there's execute until return which will finish the current subroutine until it's time to move up to the next level up that could be useful 
and here we are execute till user code because you're stuck in libraries and you want to get out of the library and get back to the code written by the developer it'll go until it hits the text section of the of the malware and this is the stuff I don't remember any of that stuff for ever use it all I ever use is f7 f8 and f9 those are the simple ones f step is one single step f8 is step over and f9 is just run to a breakpoint or anything else so those are good all right so let's try some cahoots All right, 126. Nine A, there we go. Good. All right. All right, maybe we got everybody that's coming. I guess so. Oh, well, maybe not. Okay, I'll wait a few more seconds. All right. All right, so which key press sets a breakpoint? Okay, that's it. F2. Good. Wow, almost perfect. A thousand points is the maximum possible. All right. Which key press modifies a line of assembly code? That's it. The space bar. Again, almost perfect. Which key press steps over? Okay, F8, good. And which key press runs until user code? Yep, Alt F9. Okay, good. All right, they'll have to tell me who they are if they want points. That person's uh, real initials, and I think we know who that is. And that's more or less real initials. You know who that is, too. Good. It's just J we don't know. All right, good. So, let's go to here. All right. So breakpoints. Breakpoints are the main thing you, I do use from a debugger. It's the main value you get out of it. And usually software breakpoints, which is the most common, simplest. And all these other ones, I've never really had to use them, except maybe just once or twice breakpoints on memory. So F2 will add a breakpoint, a software breakpoint. You can view breakpoints or click the B icon on the toolbar up here. And then breakpoints show up in red. 
Those are spots where the program will stop when it gets there because it has modified the contents of memory and put a CC there instead of the real byte. And a CC is a breakpoint. So that's what F2 does. It puts a software breakpoint there, which is normally what you want. And you can have as many of them as you want because it just replaces that byte with CC and somewhere in the memory of the debugger, it remembers what byte to put in there when, you go, when it's time to run through that breakpoint. This gives you a conditional breakpoint, a hardware breakpoint, memory on access or write, and you can do all of them with a right-click breakpoint and then choosing these other things. All right, so uh, when you open, yep, yeah, breakpoints are real important. The main, the main thing in a debugger that's worthwhile, the main thing I use all the time is breakpoints. So you open the program, you put in some breakpoints, and when you close it, it will save the breakpoints. So when you reopen the same file again, it will load your old breakpoints, let you pick up where you left off. So that's a thing to be aware of. Uh, simply closing it and reopening a file does not get you back to zero. All right, so software breakpoints um, are useful for anything where you want to stop partway through. One of the more common things is um, you've got some encrypted strings here. You can't read them. Then it's going to call some function that decodes them. So you put a breakpoint after that, and then look in RAM, like on the stack, and you'll find the decrypted stuff. So that's very handy. I've done this in all kinds of languages. Um, and if you're doing the flare on chapter to flag, which, by the way, I don't know if I remember to tell you this, but this is probably the most important uh, CTF for this class. If you go to my homepage, a flare on is the people who made the flare VM. You mentioned, she mentioned in my projects. You should, you should all try this out, although it's quite difficult. I'm only only made it up to level three, and I've been stuck there for like a week, and I may not even ever finish level three. I got a, so it's very hard, but you'll learn a lot doing what little you might be able to do. Or and if you get further, that's great. But this happens every year, and a lot of my homework comes from old versions of the Flareon CTF. So it's worth extra credit if you want to try this. Ah, I'm Jay. Oh, good. Okay, thank you. I can make a note of that name. Good. Okay, I got it. Whoop, also we'll close something I shouldn't have closed. There, it's back. Okay. Good. Yes, I am stuck on level two or three. I think I was stuck on level three. Level two I was able to do. Anyway, when it's over, in a week or two, then I'll be happy to talk about it, and then they will publish complete solutions. So you know if you are stuck, if you wait a few weeks, the total walkthroughs and solutions will be there, and then it'll be like my homework assignments where someone guides you through it which, you know, that's what I have to do for most of them. So it does suffer for, from teaching purposes from being too difficult. Uh, there are some CTFs that are actually easy enough that students can make some progress through them, like the easy CTF, but uh, most of the CTFs, they're too hard. This one has, suffers from that. The first level or two is all right, and after that it gets, like, super hard. Anyway, so uh, put a breakpoint at the end of the decoder, and then you'll find it in the stack. So that's a good idea. Um, now, a conditional breakpoint would be if you have a more complicated situation, like Poison Ivy, for example. Poison Ivy was a um, rootkit used on Windows XP. And what it did was it would um, have, it would always run and listen for signals on the network so you could take over the machine. And it would call a Windows system library to allocate a region of memory. But unfortunately, that allocator is called many times for other purposes. So you would want to break on the Windows System Memory Allocation Library call, but only, which is a virtual alloc function, but only if the parameters are in a certain range. If you put a standard breakpoint in virtual alloc, then it will, if it breaks, it'll show you the parameters here. And the parameters include the size. This is 29, which is 29 hexadecimal, which is 41 bytes. So it's allocating a region only 41 bytes big. And so what you want to do is you only want to block if it has more than 100 bytes being allocated in order to get the interesting breakpoint. And so you can do that here. You can have a condition which will determine. And what it does is it breaks every time, but then it evaluates this condition. And if the condition is not satisfied, it presses F9 for you and runs again. So it does pause briefly every time this is called, but then it runs again. It doesn't really stop except when your condition is true. So that's handy if you have one of these fairly complicated situations. I've never debugged anything that complicated, but it's there if you want it. And then there's the hardware breakpoints, which are in the hardware of the processor, so you do not have to modify the conditions of memory. 
Well, I mentioned normal breakpoints involve putting a CC in memory on top of a byte, and that means if there's some kind of checksum or something to validate a memory of region, a region of memory, it will fail that test. So sometimes it's not okay to modify the contents of memory. In that case, you use a hardware breakpoint, which will record an address and say break when you hit this address without modifying the contents of that address. And that's an option. Um, but you can only map four of them at a time. The hardware only allows you four addresses to break on. And you can define memory breakpoints, um, which can be done in software or hardware. So Ali Debug will break there, and then it will, like a conditional breakpoint, decide what was happening at this address. And you can decide to only really stay broken if it was a certain kind of activity, like only when it reads this address, only when it tries to execute code at this address, or any access, that sort of thing. This could be regarded as just a special uh, case of the conditional breakpoint. All right, you can only have one of them at a time, and it does this, they say, by changing the attributes of a memory box, so it's expensive and has some overhead. So uh, again, I've never used that exotic stuff, but uh, it must be complicated situations in which you have to do that. All right, and so for example, if you want to see when a library is used, you could right click the DILS text section and you could set a memory breakpoint on the entire access of this area. So anytime it tries to run any of the code in the text section, it will then tell you. Then you can find out when is this library used. That's one reason you might want to do it. All right. Yes, it's very, yeah. Anyway, so let's take a look at uh, 9b, which is favorites. 9b. Okay, good. Level 3 in the Flareon QTF is in a container, a Docker container, and I learned how to dump all the code out of a Docker container, which I never knew how to do before. So. Even though I can't find the flag yet, I've learned quite a lot making steps towards it. <laughs> when I get competitive, I get really frustrated on these CTFs that are way too hard, and I have to change my mind and say, I'm not here to win, I'm here to learn something. So. I look at the puzzle and I find some part of it I can figure out and I figure that out and I say, there, I learned something. <laughs> Even though I may very well not get as far as they expected me to get. When I started like 15 years ago, I thought I was, I knew a lot and I should be winning these things. And I got over that, man, you learn some humility. The fact is, everything you learn at a college and everything you find in textbooks does not get you up to the state of the art at all. So, I know, it's, that's the thing about CTFs. You have to change your mind and forget about competing and just say, well, I'm here to see if there's anything I can learn. <laughs> and you will be confronted with the fact that you are still a mile behind the experts. Even when you think you know a lot, you don't know so much. That will never stop at any level in this business. This is a hard business. And no matter how high you go, there'll be a bunch of people a mile ahead of you doing stuff you can't really understand. You just have to get used to that. <laughs> they call it imposter syndrome. It's a psychological barrier in this business. You will always feel stupid. It will never stop. Yeah, you have to develop defenses against that. So that's something I often always warn my students. You are not going to learn enough to be a world expert in these classes. What you are going to learn is enough to get a job. You know, you'll be enough to be hired and get into a company and have some have a job. That's all we do. We get you started. You won't be an industry leader unless you do a lot more than you'll learn in these classes. But you don't have to be an industry leader to get a job and pay the rent, which is my goal. <laughs> yeah. All right. Anyway. All right. All right. What's the most common kind of breakpoint?
a software breakpoint. And uh, yeah, I see Dark Rogue is quite correct. People sometimes quit their job with that imposter stuff. You know, the question is, it's a question of ego. Do I really have to be the best guy in the world? Um, and you know, you probably aren't. But on the other hand, you know, maybe I can settle for just being pretty good, you know. <laughs> it's an ego issue. Yeah. Anyway. Um, all right. All right, what kind of breakpoint is limited to only one? That's the breakpoint on memory. You're only allowed to have one of them. And what kind of breakpoint lets you have only four of them? Hardware breakpoint, there you go. All right. So, all right, I know who that is. All right. All good. All right. So, there we go. All right. So, good. Yeah, well, I mean, it's a, this is a thing to realize, but you know, in, it's all a matter of pride. Like, I know I'm not the richest guy in the world. I'm not the strongest guy in the world. Why would I think I'd be the smartest guy in the world? You know, you have to realize you just have to do the best you can with what you got. <laughs> you have to, uh, and these CTFs, you're comparing yourself, you know, the smartest people in the world are doing them. You, it's not a disgrace if you don't win. <laughs> But you have to readjust your ego. I remember I won the black badge at DEF CON, the highest prize, but I won it as the smallest contribution in a team to the lamest contest. So I'm not the best of the best. I am the worst of the best. I had to adjust my ego. I said, well, that's not nothing. It's not sort of what I hoped for, but that's where I am, you know. <laughs> you have to accept your limitations. Anyway, find one of the real hot shots at work. Yeah, I mean, you learn what you can and you, you contribute something, you know. But, um, you know, we're not all Albert Einstein or Bill Gates. You're not going to be the greatest in the world at something. <laughs> I heard a podcast where they said people that win the gold medal at the Olympics, they tend to be like real unhappy and insecure. And they said people who, but people who win the bronze medal tend to be really happy because they didn't expect to win any medal at all. And they feel like they did a lot better than their expectations. You know, it's not exactly what you accomplish. It's compared to what you expected to accomplish. I think they said the silver medal people are really miserable because they really thought they were going to get the gold. But the bronze people thought they were going to get nothing, so they feel pretty much good, you know. So, yeah, yeah. It's the silver. That's silver and bronze. Yeah, somebody pointed out. It's silver and bronze. The silver medal people feel miserable because they feel like they should have got the gold. But the bronze people feel really happy because they were glad to get anything at all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, you know, uh, in reality, you know, you have, to, you have to figure out what you want in life. You want to get enough money to pay the rent and, you know, do, do good work and accomplish something, you know. And do you really want to be the most ex amazing guy in the world at something, an Olympic gold medalist or the richest guy in the world or something? You really have to have that because you probably can't have that, you know. That's pretty crazy. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. All right, so um, if you want to load a library and run it directly, um, Ali Debug can do that with a program called Load Dill, and it'll make could a breakpoint at Dill main. A normal program in C has a main routine, and that's where you start. Otherwise, it might be called start or something. And um, libraries have a thing called Dill main that is run when they're first loaded. That's where they start. That prepares them for use. So you can run Dill main. All right, and so. Uh, if I load, you, I could load WS232. I don't think I'll do this one live. We got other things to do a little later. But um, if you load, you can load a library live. And um, 
then I can load a library and have the exports, and I can actually run a specific function in there and feed in the values. I don't think I'll go through this because it seemed kind of esoteric and I've never really had to do it. But you can, in fact, run a library alone and call a function alone and feed in the argument and see the, the other argument come out. This is NTOHL is something that just reverses the order of bytes. So if you put in 127.001 in network byte order, which is 7F001, and then run it, it will turn it into those things in the other order. 1007F. That's all it does. It switches things from uh, little endian to big endian. <laughs> a very simple routine. But anyway, yeah, you can, it's a thing you can run. But tracing is another kind of debugging technique, and I think I do want to demo this one. Let me see if I've got my machine running. I'll get it going. Uh, there we go. By the way, you're probably getting warnings if you're using my Windows 10 with tools that the license is expiring. Uh, we're going to see if we can keep using it with license expired. Otherwise, I might have to make a new one. I think we only get like 90 days or 180 days on these windows, and it's running out. So I might make a more current version if I have to. I'll let you know. I think you can use it when the license expired, but it might shut down after every two hours, which is kind of annoying. Anyway, um, all right. So we'll talk about the types of backtraces that are available. A backtrace means you can move forward with step into or step over, and you can use a minus key on the keyboard to move back and see the previous instruction, but it will not show you the previous registry values or memory values. It's not like undo in Microsoft Word where you go all the way back. It just goes shows you which instruction was before, but it doesn't show you the other values that were there before. But you can use minus and plus to go forward and back. Um, but if you do want to actually go backwards the way you could in Microsoft Word with undo, Ollie can do that, but you have to um, you have to turn that on. But, bef but uh, before that, let's talk about the call stack. And I've got a demo here. So uh, this is the 000 routine. Let me move my slides to the side. Okay, here's my machine. So there's this game. Uh, which you're going to be, I'll be demonstrating it later. It's part of the, um, uh, part of Project PMA 401. And I think I got it from Easy CTF for one of the, one of the Easy Capture Flag contests. So if I go to Downloads, okay, and then a dir, it should be up, here it is, 0000.exe, because originally there were thousands of these things just numbered. And this is just one of them. So if you run that program, it asks, whoops, you got to run it without putting an apostrophe at the end. Okay, it says, ask you for a number, you give it a number, and it insults you. I think my dog figured this out before you. And somewhere is the right number, and that's all this game is. All right, so we can load it in a debugger. We'll load it in Ollie. And the great thing about it is the entire program is incredibly simple in assembly language, so it's a really good learning tool. The whole program is right here. This is the end of it. This screen is the entire assembly code of this program. It is incredibly simple. It calls put s to print the launch codes message. Then it calls scan f to read a number from the user. Then it does some kind of comparison and jump to make a decision whether something is zero or not. And then it prints either, wow, you got it, or I think my dog uh, got the answer before you did. So this is apparently when you get it wrong, and this is when you get it right. And that's it. <laughs> so this is a very simple program, very easy to understand, very easy to hack, and that's why we got it here to play with it. But now all I want to do is show you the call stack. So there's the entire main. So if I move so right now, it has stopped right here, paused. If I press F7, it will move ahead. One step, launch code, put S. Now I pressed F7, so I've moved into the system. I'm now inside module MSVCRT. I'm now inside the Windows code, which remember where I said I didn't want to be. Now, my screen is freezing up. Uh, let me know in the text if you people are having trouble seeing the video, but it came back for me. So now I'm in the Microsoft code. Now, what was it? Was it Shift or Alt F9? Let's try I want to go back to user code. Debug, execute till user code. Alt F9. I'm going to try this. Alt F9. Oh, good. That got me back up here to the main thread again. And if I scroll back, yep, there it is. Neat. 
So I should have been using F8. See, because I used F7, it went into this Microsoft routine. So I was wandering around inside there where I don't want to be. So I'm going to use F8 instead to move forward here. So it now has printed out the message launch codes. And you'll see them here, launch codes, a little message there. In fact, I could probably make that bigger. Let's see. Yeah, I think I can make that bigger. Yeah, launch codes. Okay. All right, so now I'm going to press F8 again. And now it's ready to read from the user. So when I press F8, now it pauses because it's waiting for me to type in something here. It's not going to move forward until I do. So I put in a number and press Enter. And now it moves to the next command. So I can now press F8. And F8, I can use minus to go back. But when I go back, these registers don't change or anything. I can use plus to go forward. But, and if I hit plus again, it's not going to move any because this is as far forward as I've gone. So anyway, uh, if you look at the stack here, right now the only thing in here is return to kernel. Um, but if I move ahead, it's eventually going to call one of these subroutines, and we're going to see the stack get bigger. So right now, if I do a call stack, view call stack, you're going to see there's nothing here but returning to the kernel, which is getting back to Windows from where I am. I'm only one layer deep in the program. But if I move forward with F8 for a while, until I'm ready to call another subroutine, okay, here I'm about to call a puts. So now I'm going to hit F7. Now I'm in the Microsoft library, and now the call stack will be deeper. Call stack. Yeah, now see, here's the kernel. Then there's a message put on the stack. And here's the next address. The red is the return messages. So now I'm in this routine. And I have a return value to get back to the program here, and then to get back to the kernel. So that's the call stack showing where you are. All right. And I think the other thing I planned on demonstrating here was the um, uh, run trace. So let's do that so we can really run backwards. So if I'm going to, when you do this, we run a program and you wandered into some dark alley and you're lost, I just do debug restart. That will get you back to the original. It warns you you're going to lose everything, which is fine. Now I'm back to the original start. Now if I want to run this whole program and I want to be able to run it forwards and backwards, I highlight it. And now, right-click, Run Trace, Add Selection. And now, when I run the program, it's going to remember everything just like Microsoft Word. So I can do F8, 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 F8. And now I, if I go back, which I think is still just the minus sign. Yep. Now, if I go back from here with the minus sign, it's going to update everything. Or it should update everything. I'm not seeing anything change here, though. But uh, if I do plus, uh, it's not as exciting as I thought it would be. This red stuff on the left tells you that it's recording everything, though. I um, wonder if I can do F7. Yeah. OK, F8. Plus, I guess I'm not at the end. Plus, plus, plus. All right, I seem to be lost somehow. F7, F8, doesn't do anything. Oh, because it's waiting for input from me, probably. Yep, OK, good. All right, now it's got input from me. Now, if I do minus, what's it going to do? Where did that? Eh, I'm not sure I can see the actual meaningful stuff changing here. Let's go forward some more. F8, F8, F8. Oh, see, the EAX is changing up here. Now, if I go back with the minus sign, uh, it should be changing back, but I'm not seeing it. Okay, so this uh, run trace, I hit, hit trace instead of run trace? Oh, maybe that's it. Why, thank you. I didn't even know what a heck a hit trace is. Good. Like I say, I never used this. Let's try it again, then. Good. I'm glad you people are paying attention, because I, uh, I've only used this for demo. It's... Uh, Trace. Oh, oh, the hit trace. What the heck is hit trace? Okay, run trace, add selection. Okay, now what happens if I run forward with F8? And now I run back with minus. Ah, now it's changing this stuff. Thank you. That's what I wanted to see. It. Good. I appreciate the help. Good. All right. 
that's all I wanted to show you. That crazy run trace thing, which I have never used. <laughs> but it is available in the program. All right. And so I think there was something. Yeah, so here's an example of a deep call stack in one of the malware samples where you just have many, many routines, like seven or eight or ten layers deep when you stop somewhere in the middle of that. Good. I'm glad you folks are paying attention to catch my mistakes. I appreciate it. I remember when I was the student like you, looking at the professor, wondering why I made so many dumb mistakes. Now I kind of understand how it happens. Up here, you have other things on your mind. Anyway, um, all right. So that's the run trace. All right. And you can do trace into and trace over the way you do uh, run, step into and step over while you're tracing. Those are other options. All right. And here's the one you can debug set condition that will trace until a condition hits. So you can have uh, more complicated situations there. All right. And then there's exception handling, which is quite a big deal if you take the 127 class, which is we're not teaching this semester exploit development. We do some structured exception handler exploits, where you cause an exception, and then you exploit the exception. So an exception occurs when some kind of problem occurs, um, like a break is an exception, uh, CC, to go back. And there are other exceptions, like divide it by zero and illegal access and stuff like that. And those are handled either by a structured exception handler written by the developer, or if that does not handle the exception, it goes to the operating system, which will pop up some kind of default box, like uh, please tell Microsoft about this problem, your program has stopped unexpectedly, that sort of thing. So if an exception happens, you can step into the exception, step over it, or run the exception handler. Normally, in malware analysis, we don't care about exceptions um, because we're not trying to debug the code. But some exploits actually use exceptions, but they're not the most common type. And you can patch code, which we're totally going to do, and I'll be demonstrating that a little later. You can modify running code. You can take some of the instructions and replace them with other things, like zeros or nops, or type in assembly language commands to rewrite part of the code. All right, fill with zero, fill with nop. Um, and you can save code after patching it, but you should save it after each change if you don't want to go mad, because uh, it doesn't always save all the changes when you save it. Um, and there's a technique to analyze shell code where you can take binary shell code from a hex editor and you can load it in memory assign a memory segment in the debugger and run it there. That's one way to do it. In practice, this is too much bother. I find it much easier to just put it in a C program and compile it. Put it in C program as data. There's various techniques of that. And we'll, if you take 127, uh, when we offer it, we'd go into some detail about how to do this. Um, but anyway, um, shell code is the egg of an attack where you run code that's going to take over the machine. And it's always very small and minimalist. and um, it's hard to develop and hard to debug. All right. Normally, you just let some tool like Metasploit write the shell code for you. All right. So there's a log, which shows all the things you did to reach where you are. So you can go back there to see what happened if you get lost. Uh, there's a place where you can watch the value of an expression. It'll just calculate it and show it there, which might be useful if you're debugging a complicated piece of malware. In fact, this might help me with the uh, flare contest where I'm stuck. Maybe I should use it there. Anyway, you can label things um, with meaningful labels, which is a very common technique as you diagnose a program for what this routine does and what that routine does. And there are plugins to extend OLLI. Um, OLLI dump is one we've already used in this class uh, for manual unpacking. There's other ones that try to hide it from debugger detection and bookmarks and command line. There's various OLLI debug uh, plugins. And you can write scripts. Uh, apparently, OLLI debug does not use Python. I don't really know what it uses, but immunity debug uses Python scripts. And therefore, Python is easy to program in. So you could write your own scripts if you want to do something exotic. All right. And there's a library of standard user scripts people have written, but I've never used any of them except OLLI dump. But I've only done the simple stuff. All right, let's do 9C, which is favorites. 9C is here. All right.
All right, I'll give it a few more seconds. All right, guess we got everybody. Oh, maybe not. Okay. Okay, what does the minus sign do? <clears throat> That's a backtrace. It just shows you where the previous command was. All right, which one lets you go back and see the previous register values? The one I had trouble setting up. All right, that's a run trace. That's what they call it. Backtrace is the previous one where you just see where you came from. This is the one where you see you roll it back like undo, where everything goes back to the previous condition. All right, what feature shows all the functions that are waiting for execution to resume? Yep, that's the stack trace. All the routines that you could return to if you were going to finish the program or turn all the way back up to Windows. You'd go all the way through all the return addresses in the stack trace to find your way back home. All right, which one shows you all the modules that were loaded before the current one? That's the log. It shows you all the libraries and everything that were loaded. All right. All right. I know who that is. I know who that is. And I know who that is. Good. All right. So I'll stop recording this one.